Welcome back. Today we are doing the second of two lectures on the limits of reason and the philosophy of common sense. This will bring to a close our discussion of classic enlightenment epistemology. Um, next time we'll begin two lectures that will bring us into the 20th century back to our old friend Gilbert Ryle um, to close out this part of the course. <clears throat> I want to pick up where we left off and talk today in a bit more detail about uh, the, the essential hallmarks of the philosophy of common sense, also known as Scottish natural, naturalism, also known as common sense philosophy. It's gone under a lot of names. Um, but there are several uh, uh, hallmarks to this position uh, to, or to this cluster of positions because really it's not just one school of thought, but it's several schools of thought that have existed since the Enlightenment um, with, a, with a certain common, a common thread and a common attitude towards inquiry. And um, in, in discussing this, we are going to look at some uh, work by David Hume and by Thomas Reed, who we've already discussed uh, and, and whom we've already uh, examined a little bit. But today we're going to go into more detail uh, and, and talk about their views uh, a bit more comprehensively. So let's just begin with the general, with the, with the hallmarks of Scottish naturalism. And I would say that probably the, the sort of the main, the main, the main sense in which the, the Scottish naturalist uh, uh, outlook differs or diverges from the standard classic Enlightenment view is in, is in its estimation of human nature, how it understands a hu human beings as distinct from the rest uh, of the creatures on the earth. As we've said um, before, philosophy traditionally has had a rationalistic uh, mindset. That is, it, it has seen uh, human beings as distinct for their capacity to think and to reason. And that this, uh, this, this way of thinking about human beings, this picture of human nature, has, has certainly led philosophy in certain directions and led philosophy and, and not led philosophy in other directions. And it's at this very fundamental uh, notion of what a human being is and what is distinctive about a human being that the philosophers of common sense really uh, diverge from the mainline tradition uh, in philosophy. The Scottish naturalists uh, are convinced that human beings are not just thinkers or knowers, that's not a word, but we've been talking about knowledge in this part of the course. Human beings are not simply creatures that think or acquire knowledge, but human beings are doers. We are actors. Uh, and we're actors in a way that animals uh, are not. That is, an animal, uh, on, on this way of thinking, uh, certainly behaves. An animal is a uh, behavior, also not a word. Um, but an animal, in that sense, is, is, largely, a, is largely a mechanism. Uh, a kind of organic machine who behaves according to um, sort of the principles of its nature. Uh, a human being is an actor in a more sig a substantial sense um, in that uh, we not only behave but we act in a deliberate and a sort of conscious fashion that implicates in, in our identities in a way much more than, 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 than it does in an animal. An animal's behavior doesn't, in a sense, speak to its identity in the way that a human being's actions speak uh, to, 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 to his or her behavior. Now, this idea that human beings are not simply thinkers or knowers, acquirers of knowledge, but doers, actors, um, uh, is crucial to understanding the Scottish naturalist position. Uh, Hume says that in a normal, sound, healthy human being, Thought and activity must exist in a balance with one another. That is, thought can never become so excessive that it prohibits or infringes upon activity. And likewise, activity should never become so encompassing that it precludes thought. Uh, Hume says this very clearly. And, and one of the wonderful things about reading Hume is his absolute clarity and his um, uh, straightforwardness in, in articulating his positions. There's nothing coy or obfuscating about Hume. Hume says in the bottom of page 8 uh, of, your, of your readings, he says, quote, Man is a reasonable being, meaning a thinker, and as such receives from science his proper food and nourishment. 
Then he goes on to say, but man is a sociable no less than a reasonable being. Man is also an active being. And from that disposition, as well as from the various necessities of human life, he must submit to business and occupation. Okay. It seems then that nature has pointed out a mixed kind of life as most suitable to the human race and secretly admonished them to allow none of these biases to draw too much so as to inc incapacitate them for some other occupations and entertainments. Indulge your passion for science, says she, nature, but let your science be human and such as may have a direct reference to action and society. So Hume is very clearly saying that nature has designed us both with the capacity to think and the capacity to act, and that the healthy, normal human being does both, and does both in balance and in harmony with one another, and never does one or the other to, uh, to, the, to the exclusion of the other, uh, and thus to extremes. <coughs> Indeed, Hume argues that the person who... Uh, is an excessive cognizer, the person who excessively emphasizes the rational rather than the active side of his being, um, Hume says such a person is actually uh, mentally ill. Now he doesn't use the word mental illness and of course uh, but in the 18th century they didn't have the kinds of conception of mental illness that we have today. But what Hume says about the person of excessive rationality or the person who is, who, who is excessive in uh, in thinking rather than doing, the words that Hume uses to describe such a person are precisely the kinds of words uh, that we use today to describe someone who is mentally ill. He says, quote, and he's still talking here about what nature prescribes for human beings, he says, quote, abstruse thought and profound researches I prohibit and will severely punish, this is nature talking, by the pensive melancholy which they introduce, by the endless uncertainty in which they involve you, and by the cold reception which your pretended discovery shall meet when communicated. All right, so he's saying, the person who does nothing but think, the person who does nothing but reason, the person who spends their entire lives in a kind of a, uh, 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 desperate pursuit for, for uh, truth and for justification, as we've been talking about these concepts, um, is inevitably going to be depressed. Because, as we have seen, um, the, the, the train of rational justifications at some point must come to an end. There is no way, ultimately, to justify our most foundational, most basic beliefs, those beliefs that underlie everything else we believe, the belief in the external world, the belief that there are minds, other, that there are other uh, minds other than my own, um, sort of found fundamental beliefs that underlie our entire worldview, our entire way of thinking about things. Um, there ultimately is no way to rationally justify these beliefs. And so the person who is excessively rational in their mindset is going to uh, ultimately find himself in a state of depression. The depression that comes when one uh, is frustrated in one's, in one's pursuits and also is going to find himself uh, suffering a kind of paralysis because of course if you're the sort of person who requires a justification for, for everything before you believe it or do it, when such a justification is not forthcoming, one will find oneself in a kind of uh, uh, incapacitated, paralyzed state of being unable to act. And he also here mentions the cold reception which you shall be met with. Um, I have found, I'm sure you will find, that most people ha don't have very much patience for a, a very long uh, philosophical disputation. And certainly people don't have patience for uh, skepticism when it goes beyond merely the kind of healthy doubts that we should have uh, in order not to be too cr excessively credulous but become the kind of doubts that simply are, are, are ends in themselves. People I, I, I found tend to have very little patience for this and this is why he says um, the excessive rationalizer, the excessive thinker will meet with a, as he says, cold reception. The, the, notice that, that, that being a doer if we're going to say that a human being is both a thinker and a doer, an acquirer of knowledge as well as an actor uh, in, 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 in a social context, um, that being a doer means that thinking at some point has to come to an end. 
right? At some point, if you're going to do something, that means you must have made a decision. In order to have made a decision means you must have already reached, you must have reached a conclusion. And, in order to re and, and reaching a conclusion means that one's thinking uh, is at an end. <coughs> now, we've seen that our ability to find or identify um, reasons for the things we believe at some point re uh, reaches a point at which um, it sort of can be pursued but without, any f without, without bearing any fruit, right? right? If you remember our discussion of Descartes, there reaches a point at the point at which we're trying to justify our belief in the existence of the external world, trying to justify our belief in the existence of persons or minds other than our own, um, and we can add to this other uh, sort of ground level beliefs um, that, that, that seem to admit of no justification. Um, the person who insists upon uh, justifying prior to believing, right, proving prior to believing and thus prior to acting, is going to find him or herself incapable of acting. At some point in order to act, you have to terminate that process of searching for proof, searching for justifications, and simply choose one belief or another, one position or another. One is going to have to make a decision. So being a doer um, means that thinking at some point has to come to an end. That one finally must take a position, even if it has not been proven to the nth degree. And so the, the, the common sense philosophy uh, the, 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 the Scottish naturalist emphasis on a balanced view of human nature, of uh, this picture of human beings as both thinkers and doers, means that the common sense philosopher values prudence as much as truth. Right? The common sense philosopher is as concerned with sound judgment and behavior in the sense of soundness that, that means sort of uh, uh, judgment, and uh, judgment and behavior that sort of in the long term has good results, um, the common sense philosopher is going to be as concerned with prudence in that sense uh, as, as, he, as he or she is going to be concerned with always being in possession of the truth. And this is really the main reason why the Scottish naturalist rejects Pyrrhonism. Right? Pyrrhonism ultimately it's funny, Pyrrhonism is on one hand the most, in many ways, the most rational philosophy, right? right? If one truly lives according to reason and, and only according to reason, then the fact that our beliefs cannot be justified entails that we ought to suspend all judgment until such a justification is forthcoming. Right? So in a sense, the Pyrrhonist is the ultimate rationalist, in that the Pyrrhonist uh, is really very, very, very true to this devotion to reason, um, but it's precisely um, this rationalism that makes, also makes the Pyrrhonist the least prudent of all philosophers, right? right? If by prudence we mean sort of sound judgment, then surely no one, no, no one thinks that, that sound judgment consists of withholding all belief until proof is forthcoming, even when that proof is not forthcoming. Right. So loyalty to reason above all else, um, while, while, while sort of pristinely rationalistic, is also catastrophically imprudent. And this is the reason why the common sense philosopher ultimately rejects Pyrrhonism. Right? Pyrrhonism is an unlivable philosophy. And human beings are meant to live, not merely to contemplate. Right? You can't honestly, th think, th think about this, just take the most basic belief, the belief in the existence of the external world. This is an unlivable philosophy. Right? If you don't believe that the external world exists, then you cannot sit in a chair. You cannot ring a doorbell. If you don't believe in the existence of, other, of minds other than your own, then you can't talk to anyone. You can't interact with others. Now, of course, there's no Pyrrhonist who is able to be so pure in their suspension of disbelief that they literally existed in a state of complete inactivity. And so Pyrrhonism really is an unlivable philosophy. It is a purely academic position. 
And for the common sense philosopher, this is um, grotesque because human beings aren't merely contemplators. They are uh, living, active social beings and are meant to engage life. So there's really, the, 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 the Scottish naturalist's chief objection to Pyrrhonism is that there's no point to it. Now, if all you're concerned about is with truth and falsity, then the question of whether something has a point is irrelevant. But if you're concerned as much with living as with truth, if, you're cons if, if, if you value prudence as much as you value um, knowledge, then the fact that um, an, 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 activity like, uh, 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 an activity like philosophy has no point is, of course, uh, very important. Now, uh, there's several places in which Hume and, um, and Reed talk about the kind of pointlessness of Pyrrhonism, the sense in which Pyrrhonism is an unlivable philosophy and thus can have no positive effect on human life. And let me just read you, and, and incidentally, some, some of Reed's most colorful remarks come when he talks about this. He says some actually quite funny things. Uh, in describing what someone would have to do to actually be a Pyrrhonist. He sort of talk, at one point talks about people walking into poles because they're absolutely insisting upon not believing that the pole exists. Um, so let me just read a scatter of these quotations and then you can sort of on your own, on your own time, uh, dig around and find some more. There's some real gems here. First let's look at Hume, pages 158 to 159. And here Hume is talking about the sort of the imprudence and ultimately the uncompelling nature of Pyrrhonism beca precisely because it can't serve as a philosophy for living. It says at the bottom of 158, the great subverter of Pyrrhonism or the excessive principles of skepticism is action and employment and the occupations of common life. These principles may flourish and triumph in the schools where it is indeed difficult if not possible to refute them, but as soon as they leave the shade and by the presence of the real objects which actuate our passions and sentiments are put in opposition to the more powerful principles of our nature, they vanish like smoke and leave the most determined skeptic in the same condition as other mortals. So he's saying, look, so long as you restrict yourself to a sort of a purely academic discussion in the classroom or in the study, and you focus entirely on the question of justification and reasons and so on and so forth, you might be able to sort of at least talk the Pyrrhonist talk. He says, but the minute you walk outside the study, the minute you turn around to engage in some practical activity, even one as mundane as going to the bathroom or going out for a smoke, right? the minute you do that, all these Pyrrhonist principles disappear, they evaporate, because one's very activity betrays one's lack of belief in the Pyrrhonist principle. He then goes on to say at the bottom of page 459, here is the chief and most confounding objection to excessive skepticism. No durable good can ever result from it while it remains in its full force and vigor. We need only ask such a skeptic what his meaning is and what he proposes by all these curious researches. A little further down on 160. A Peronian cannot expect that his philosophy will have any constant influence on the mind, or if it had, that its influence would be beneficial to society. On the contrary, he must acknowledge, if he will acknowledge anything, that all human life must perish, whereas principles universally and steadily to prevail, all discourse, all action would immediately cease, and men would remain in a total lethargy. So, no one can actually sustain the Pyrrhonists' doubts and the Pyrrhonists' suspension of belief in real life, and no one would want anyone to, to, to sustain such doubts uh, in real life because they would ultimately uh, and very quickly lead to the utter paralysis and hence the destruction of human life. And so um, Pyrrhonism uh, is simply an academic uh, philosophy that has no uh, real interest and for the Scottish naturalist who values prudence as much as truth this is a damning indictment uh, of Pyrrhonism. Reed says uh, pretty much the same thing although although his examples are quite a bit funnier. Um, he says in the bottom of page 16, 169 he's talking about uh, he's talking about the belief in the external world he says 
I think it would not be prudent to throw off this belief even if it were in my power. Next page he says, what is the consequence? So now he's imagining. I resolve not to believe my senses. I break my nose against the post that comes in my way. I step into a dirty kennel. And after 20 such wise and rational actions, I am taken up and clapped into a madhouse. Now I confess I would rather make one of the credulous fools whom nature imposes upon than of those wise and rational philosophers who resolve to withhold assent at all his expense. So he says, look, you know, if I was actually to do what the Pyrrhonists suggest, I would walk into poles, I would step into holes, and within 20 minutes after being such a rational person, I'd be locked up as a lunatic. He says, I'd rather be one of the vulgar common folk than such a wise, rational philosopher. So Reed here is not only saying that there's no point to Pyrrhonism, but he's showing utter contempt for the view. And it's important to remember this. The contempt that, that Reed is showing for Pyrrhonism, the, 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 sort of the, 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 the charge of imprudence, is itself a rejection of rationalism, is a rejection of the idea that human beings are defined entirely by their reason or that human belief and action must always be justified in reason before uh, we can proceed with uh, the activities of daily life. So the first hallmark of Scottish naturalism is this idea that human beings are not just thinkers but uh, doers. The second hallmark of Scottish naturalism is this idea, is the idea of natural belief, okay, um, and of the necessity of common sense. Now let's just sort of r r remind ourselves by common sense, Reed and Hume mean this basic stock of the stock of basic beliefs, these unjustifiable and yet absolutely essential beliefs. So put, put aside the ordinary language use of the word common sense. Right? Today the word common sense, um, while related to this use, when we describe someone as having common sense, we usually mean that they're kind of prudent, practical people. Right? That they're not, and in that sense, there's a continuity um, between Reed and Hume's, Hume and Reed's use of this word and, and the ordinary usage. But we also use the word common sense as, as, as a kind of honorific. The person of common sense um, is sort of praised as kind of a sound, salty, salt of the earth type uh, as opposed to the sort of the kind of flighty speculative, flighty speculative types um, um, uh, and the irrational types. Um, but, but what human read, when, when human read speak of common sense, and read especially uses the expression, he means the belief in the existence of the external world, bel the belief that others exist other than oneself, the belief that, um, generally speaking, the future will be like the past. This is another belief, incidentally, that cannot be rationally justified. I, will not, I cannot go through the reasons why, but it's one of the ones that Hume focuses on. Um, and of course, the belief that the future will be like the past is essential to the scientific method, is essential to inductive reasoning, right? It's on the basis of observed regularities that one may, in science, that one makes inferences about what will happen uh, later, what things in the future will be like, right? So the whole, the whole method of scientific reasoning, which is essentially inductive in nature, rests upon the belief that the future will generally be like the past, and that belief itself has no rational grounds. Right? This is one of, was one of Hume's great triumphs, was demonstrating this. It's called the problem of induction. Um, it's this stock of very fundamental but unjustifiable beliefs that Reed and Hume refer to as comprising common sense. And the second hallmark of Scottish naturalism is the idea of the necessity of common sense and the idea that the beliefs that comprise a common sense are natural in the sense that they literally come from nature. They are part of our natural constitution. They are not acquired in the manner that other beliefs are. Okay? Um, I want to say almost that, 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 that Scottish naturalists think common sense to be innate in the sense that we've already discussed, uh, the sense of innate knowledge that we've already discussed, I will say that neither Hume nor Reed refers to them as innate, as comp comprising innate knowledge. Um, 
but when they talk about these beliefs being natural and arising natural as, naturally as a part of the human constitution, um, they are certainly coming very close to an innatist uh, thesis, if not uh, actually being innatists. So this idea and the, uh, the, of, in na the, this notion of natural belief and the necessity of common sense breaks down into the idea that the most fundamental beliefs, um, those beliefs which provide the backdrop for everything else that we know, the existence of the external world and of other minds, the, ex the, the notion that the future will generally be like the past, that these beliefs have no rational warrant but are instead natural in the sense that human beings are designed by nature to hold them. And let's distinguish two ways in which these, t these beliefs are necessary. Okay? So I'm going to now talk about two, two senses of necessity, both of which these, um, these, these beliefs that comprise common sense satisfy. The first way in which Hume and Reed both think that these common sense beliefs are natural or necessary is they both think that it is impossible for a human being not to hold them. So you noticed in some of the sort of the, 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 the criticisms of the Pyrrhonist on both Hume and Reed's part, one of the lines of criticism is that no real person could actually withhold assent, um, uh, withhold belief in things like the external world. There is no actual person that could actually not uh, cease to believe in the existence of the external world, no matter how much they claim to require proof. Okay, and I'll say that again. Neither Hume nor Reed thinks that any real person, even the most devoted Pyrrhonist, can really disbelieve in the existence of the external world, despite the professed need for proof. Right? And, and you sort of ask yourself this, do you really think that anybody, forget about what they say in the, in, in the lecture hall, forget about what they say when you're having a, discourse, a philosophical argument, um, is there anyone you, you could imagine wouldn't duck if you swung a bat at their head because they have decided not to believe that the bat exists? Right? Can, you, can you think of, can you imagine such a person, human readers saying, nobody really, truly, doesn't believe in the external existence of the external world. It's a philosophical pose. So in that sense, um, natural, th th these common sense beliefs are necessary in that we can't help but believe them. And for human read, this is a sign that they are natural and not acquired. That is, that, they are not, that, that, that we don't acquire these beliefs through the normal methods of belief acquisition, through uh, sensory experience and through deductive reasoning, but rather these are beliefs that come to us naturally. This explains why we can't help but believe them. There is, however, a second, even more interesting sense in which these, in which these beliefs are necessary. These beliefs are necessary in the sense that we can't know or um, uh, we can't know anything else or even reason without believing in these things first. In other words, if you don't believe that the external world exists, then you can't know anything else about the external world. Right? So think about all the knowledge that comprises what we call science. None of that knowledge would be possible if we had no reason to exist, believe in the existence of the ex external world, if we had no reason to believe that the future, generally speaking, is like the past. Notice, unless we accepted some basic principles of reasoning, we wouldn't be able to reason about anything. We couldn't perform deductive proofs if we didn't first believe that deductive proofs are valid ways of reaching the truth. And yet, that belief is a common sense belief. It's not one that can be proven itself. So the two senses in which common sense beliefs are necessary is that one, we can't help but believe them, even though they have no, there's no proof for them, and two, that we can't know anything else or even reason without them. Okay. And both human reads say this um, um, in a very nice way. Uh, read on pages 71 to 72. Reed says at the bottom of 71, quote, All reasoning must be from first principles, 
And for first principles no other reason can be given but this, that by the constitution of our nature we are under a necessity of assenting to them. Such principles are parts of our constitution no less than the power of thinking. Reason can neither make nor destroy them, nor can it do anything without them. It is like a telescope which may help a man to see farther who hath eyes, but without eyes a telescope shows nothing at all. A mathematician cannot prove the truth of his axioms, nor can he prove anything unless he takes them for granted. We cannot prove the existence of our minds nor even of our thoughts and sensations. A historian or a witness can prove nothing unless it is taken for granted that the memory and senses may be trusted. How or when I got such first principles upon which I build all my reasoning, I know not, for I had them before I can remember. But I am sure that they are parts of my constitution and that I cannot throw them off. That our thoughts and sensations must have a subject which we call ourself is not therefore an opinion got by reasoning but a natural principle. That our senses of touch indicate something external, extended, figured, hard or soft is not a deduction of reason but a natural principle. The belief of it and the very conception of it are equally part of our constitution. I think that this one sentence here really illustrates the second sense of necessity. Incidentally, the second sense of necessity, the, the idea that these common sense beliefs are necessary in order for it to be possible to know anything else, this variety of necessity is known in the lingo as transcendental necessity. Right? So a proposition is transcendentally necessary if it is necessary for the possibility of another proposition. Right? And Hume says, uh, Reed says this very beautifully, this one sentence. I'll read the sentence again. A mathematician cannot prove the truth of his axioms. Okay? That's the sense in which the axioms cannot be justified. Nor can he prove anything unless he takes them for granted. Right? The axioms of mathematics are necessary in that without them one can't prove anything else in mathematics. This is the sense of necessity that pervades all of our common sense beliefs. They are transcendentally necessary. They are necessary in the sense that they are necessary for the possibility of knowing uh, anything else or of reasoning at all. Hume says a very similar thing on page 151. Bottom of 151. It seems evident that men are carried by a natural instinct or prepossession to repose faith in their senses, and that without any reasoning, or even almost before the use of reason, we always suppose an external universe, which depends not on our perception, but would exist though we and every sensible creature were absent or annihilated. Okay. Right, so notice how he says here, um, that, we, that we believe in the existence of the external world without reasoning, and indeed, that belief is prior to our ability to reason. In order to reason, we first have to believe things like this. We have to believe these kinds of axiomatic, basic, common sense notions before we can believe anything else, before we can reason to anything else. There's an irony here. And the irony is as follows. The rationalist, now think about the whole Enlightenment arc that we've sort of been getting glimpses of throughout, throughout this, uh, this part of the course. The whole idea of the Enlightenment was to vindicate reason over authority, right? The idea that the individual mind should seek out and, p and take possession of knowledge on its own, without external authority uh, interfering, without being dictated to by external authorities. Uh, and in the Middle Ages, those external authorities would have been the church and the royalty, the, the nobility, right? right? So there was a great sort of sense of political liberation wrapped up in this uh, rationalistic idea. And, and, and the sort of the, 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 the center of this was the idea of knowledge acquisition. Isn't it ironic that those who were most fervently committed 
to the process of the rationalistic notion of individual knowledge acquisition ultimately hold a position that makes the acquisition of knowledge impossible. While those like Hume and Reed, who are willing to let go of an awful lot, willing to say, there's an awful lot that not can't be proven. There's an awful lot that we simply have to believe for no good reason at all. Right? But it's that position which ultimately makes the acquisition of knowledge for the individual possible. I think there's, a, there's an irony in that, and there's a lesson in that about perhaps pushing too hard. Let's talk for a, a minute or two about what we're going to do next time, the next two times. Our entire discussion in this part of the course thus far, our dis entire discussion of knowledge thus far, has assumed that knowledge is a species of belief. Remember, Knowledge in this traditional view is true, justified belief. To know something then on the traditional view is to be in a mental state which represents a true picture of or otherwise corresponds to some portion of an independently existent world. Right? So in the traditional view, knowledge is a, special, is a kind of belief. Knowledge is a belief that's somehow attached to the truth. But Ryle wants to point something out, which I think is very important to point out. We use the verb to know in many ways. In other words, we don't only use the verb to know to describe a mental state. In particular, some of the ways in which we use this verb problematize the traditional conception of knowledge. Here are two other, here's another way that we use the word to know. I'm going to give two examples. Here's one. My daughter knows how to swim. Here's another. I know how to play chess. Notice here that when we use the word to know in these ways, we're not so much attributing to a person a certain mental state, rather we're describing a certain capacity or ability or competence on their part. Ryle thinks that recognizing this second use of the verb to know is very important and that it has profound implications for the traditional conception of knowing, that first conception of knowing in which knowing is true justified belief. Specifically, on the traditional view, the second type of, let's call it performative knowing, right? on the traditional view, the performative type of knowing is taken to be derivative of the, let's call it, um, epistemic or propositional type of knowing. In other words, it's the fact that I have knowledge in the first sense, that I have a set of true beliefs, that I'm able to then go and engage in competent performance. Those true beliefs play the role almost like rules or instructions that then instruct me in the correct performance. That's the traditional view of the relationship between the two kinds of knowing. The first kind makes possible the second kind. But Ryle wants to say that if we, if we reflect upon the second type of knowing, we're going to find that this traditional model of the relationship between the two is problematic, to say the least. All I want you to think about while you're reading Ryle, while you're reading Ryle I want you to do the following. I want you to try to list as many different uses of the, the, of the wor verb to know as you can. So think about all the different ways in which you use the word I know, he knows, she knows, I want you to think of all the different types of sentences that you use that word in and see if you can identify wh which ones conform to the first sort of use, uh, meaning of the word and which, so which, which of them conform to the second meaning of the word. Because this is, this is going to be crucial to understanding uh, Ryle's critique. With that, I will leave you and we will pick this up again next time. See you later.